Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Kelsey. Megan Gillian and maybe Leandro will also be presenting today. Um, and this is Coflow Rounds. We're having technical experiences over here, um, but it's going to be fine. Gillian, can they hear us now? I'm waiting for Heidi to respond. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, great, okay great, 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 great. Okay, great, great, great. Okay. The first case is the wrong sheet. Hold on. Here we go. The first case is Hayden, the 12 year old male neutered French bulldog. Um, they sent us the left glow. Um, what they told us was that there was a focal corneal, difficult to read what this word is, possibly defect or perforation, surrounded by granulation tissue. And as a result, they couldn't see anything inside the eye. They also told us that the other eye had approximately 30 thin-walled uveal cysts. Um, as per the owner, the eye had been blind for some time. The IOP was elevated when it presented today at the time of enucleation, and they didn't know why it had glaucoma. glaucoma. They wanted to do gonioscopy on the other eye, but they couldn't because of the aforementioned 30 thin-walled uveal cysts. Uh, so here is the globe that we have hemisected, and uh, there's not a ton of stuff that we can talk about grossly. I took this picture, and I only took it because it was cute. Um, <laughs> so cornea is up here, optic nerve is down here, and the cute part is these little floaty bits in the anterior chamber, and these are some of the uveal cysts that they were describing. These uveal cysts are no longer attached to anything. Um, they were floating in the aqueous and some of them floated out onto the board when I cut it and so I scooped them and put them back where they belonged because this is where they were before I cut it. <laughs> so this is somewhat staged, but that is okay. Um, and then the lens isn't in this picture because lens was posteriorly luxated so it flopped right out as soon as I cut the globe open. Um, and the vitreous was also liquefied and then this is the retina down here. Um, and so it is detached and torn and all balled up into a tiny little piece um, right at the optic nerve. And we'll be able to appreciate that on histology, which is what we will now look at. Okay. It's been like a month since I've done this. It's gonna go well. All right, so. This on the left is cornea. I'm gonna put my mouse in the middle. And you can see that there's something going on here, which likely corresponds to what they were describing clinically. Um, and then here are our iris leaflets. And then this is that jumbled up retina that's in such sad shape that we were able to appreciate grossly. This is optic nerve. Um, optic nerve doesn't look stellar. And um, because the uveal cysts weren't attached to anything, they did not make it through the journey of histologic processing. Um, so the floaters aren't in here, um, but we will be able to see some other things that were actually still attached. Stay tuned. Okay. Try to drive this really intense microscope. Okay, so. Here is that corneal problem that we were able to appreciate on subgross that they described. It's not actually a perforation and grossly we didn't appreciate it as a perforation, but it's clearly a pretty big chunk that has been taken out of the cornea. Um, so here's one side near the iris leaflets and then we move axially. Here's our big chunk taken out and then here's the other side and the other iris leaflet. And um, so we'll go look at that because it's a fairly important part of this case. Um, unfortunately, the corneal epithelium is pretty folded when we approach the actual defect, but immediately adjacent to it, the epithelium is hyperplastic. It gets kind of disorganized in some areas. It's so hyperplastic. And then um, it starts to flatten out. And then we get these flakes that are coming off of the top, and that's keratinization. Um, so these are all chronic changes that the cornea is doing in response to um, discomfort which in this case, given the boop thalamus um, is 
possibly slash likely related to exposure, chronic exposure. Um, and then as we get closer to this affected area, the corneal epithelium is completely lost. We just have this sort of map of cellular debris. A lot of these things are neutrophils in here, um, which makes sense with this kind of acute on chronic change. Um, pretty much all of these cells in here are neutrophils. And then deeper into the corneal stroma, there are a lot of blood vessels um, and some sort of increased fibrous connective tissue um, as opposed to the normal amount of fibrous connective tissue that the corneal stroma is actually composed of. Um, and so this is what they were describing as granulation tissue that they appreciated grossly as well. Um, so it's ulcerated, there is erosion or loss of the superficial corneal stroma, and then there's a lot of inflammation and blood vessel formation. And then in some areas, the corneal epithelium starts to sort of extend down into the corneal stroma. And in the places where it does that, the corneal stroma does not look great. So instead of having a normal lamellar architecture like it does here, uh, as we get more superficially, it's more loose and kind of paler staining, lightly eosinophilic. And then we have these kind of little islands of corneal epithelium that start to drop down into that stroma. And so uh, histologically, we describe that as collagenolysis. Uh, clinically, they often describe that as keratomalacia. Okay, so I told you that the cysts were not present um, histologically, and that's true. The closest thing we really have is this guy here. Um, so this is some ciliary body. Its attachment is not in the plane of section. And then coming off of that is this cyst that is composed of pigmented epithelium, which is the iridociliary epithelium. So you can see some iridociliary epithelium here that's kind of also making little baby cysts. Um, significance unclear. Um, but I will show you this other angle. Um, so this the dog had glaucoma. And there's a nice obvious reason for it to have glaucoma in the sections that we have to look at. Um, ooh, boy, here we go. Um, so we have this really thick fibrovascular membrane along the anterior surface of the iris. This is the PIFM or the pre-irrital fibrovascular membrane. It crosses the irrital corneal angle and is adhered also to Desmase membrane. So it's causing peripheral anterior synechia and there's loss of that normal drainage angle. Uh, which is a nice explanation for glaucoma. And then embedded in this membrane is this structure here, which um, is perhaps difficult to convince you that it is a floaty iridociliary cyst that floated into that membrane, but I'm going to try. So um, here's iridociliary epithelium, and the exposure isn't great because it's so black, but you can kind of see this sort of foamy material, and then this really heavily pigmented cells. And then in our embedded cyst, it's the same thing. We've got this kind of more foamy material and these really heavily pigmented cells. Um, so this is a collapsed cyst that's entrapped in the membrane. So if we didn't have the uh, actual cyst that we saw grossly, this would be a nice clue. Ooh, higher on that cyst. Sure. Just, uh, I wonder if we can identify a non-pigmented epithelium. It's yeah. difficult. I think that yeah, there the, uh, might be, like, this might be, exudate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know. It's hard because it's all right. smushed. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, all right. So we spend too much time on this case, and it's not even that interesting. So we're going to wrap it up real quick. <laughs> I like it. Okay. Leandra likes it. Never mind. All of my decisions are validated. <laughs> um, uh, there's a little bit of intraocular hemorrhage which isn't really surprising. Um, here are little shreds of retina, but if we go back here, um, we can kind of see more of the retina. Obviously it's detached. We knew that grossly. This does not come as a surprise. There are areas of hemorrhage within the retina that are relatively acute. And it's also torn. And we can appreciate that tear by looking at areas like this, where it's sort of blunt and rounded and curled on itself. Um, as a detached 
And then there's also a lot of nuclear debris in here, which suggests that there's um, either necrosis or um, apoptosis of the retina. And then they told us that there was chronic glaucoma. And so there is. We don't actually have a great piece of optic nerve in here anymore. Um, this would have been some of optic nerve. And it's so atrophic that a lot of the detached retinas has actually collapsed down into it. Um, so it had really severe glaucoma. We also described uh, equivocal gonioidysgenesis, and I'm just going to show that to you, um, not because I expect you to be well convinced, but because it's a little bit relevant um, for something about the pathogenesis of this. Um, so it's not great. <laughs> Desmase membrane uh, comes up and kind of gets really, really chunky. It doesn't arborize the way that we would expect it to with classic goniodysgenesis. There is a little bit of tissue that you could kind of imagine resembles the iris that maybe crosses the irritable corneal angle. Um, but also there's a lot of chronic changes to this globe. We know it's bupthalmic um, and it has had glaucoma for a long time. So uh, we're sometimes hesitant to interpret goniodysgenesis in globes that have really chronic changes, especially globes that have a preirital fibrovascular membrane with the peripheral anterior sneak, yeah. Uh, so all that being said, we will go back to our PowerPoint. And we diagnosed severe ulcerative keratitis. Um, that was that corneal lesion that we saw. We also diagnosed equivocal goniodysgenesis. We talked about the PIFM and the PASS and then the embedded iridociliary cysts, which we said had unknown significance. Um, there is a very nice paper documenting um, the sort of co-manifestation of both goniodysgenesis and iridociliary cysts in American bulldogs. This was a French bulldog. We don't know if French bulldogs, goniodysgenesis and iridociliary cysts all to go, go together or not, um, but it is something that we comment on and kind of keep track of. And normally we don't think the cysts cause problems, but if a dog has that many cysts, like maybe they are ending up in an angle and clogging things up. Yeah. yeah, if it has so many cysts that they can't do gonioscopy, yes. surely that's not great. <laughs> yeah, and it might not necessarily block the angle by itself, but they might become an nidus for pyrovascular membranes to go over and releasing of cytokines and things like that. Mm -hmm. Not good. Not great. <laughs> all right. I have to swiftly move on because I'm taking up all of my time and some of other people's time. The next case is Brisket, the 10-year-old neutered male mixed breed dog. They sent us the left eye. Um, for ophthalmic findings, they said, please see explanation. <laughs> Their explanation is that the patient had squinting. Um, they tried to give it neopolydex. That did not help. In fact, the eye got a lot worse and started bulging. Um, they talked to an ophthalmologist who recommended uh, additional treatment. Uh, and they had a suspicion of something that I won't tell you what it is. And then eventually the eye got worse and worse. The iris became affected. And so they recommended enucleation. Uh, so you can see here fairly spectacularly, here's the cornea. This um, probably all used to be iris. It no longer looks like iris. This all used to be choroid and is now super expanded in white, the same way that the iris is. This is the lens here, um, which we kind of did a, a sort of not great section of. <laughs> I can say that because I trimmed it. And then in the vitreous, it's kind of cloudy and um, a little bit difficult to see through. But the important things are what's happening basically in the entire uveal tract. So this is a case of used to be, you'll see why in a moment. All right. So at up here, we've got cornea. Um, and then all this purple used to be iris. And uh, this used to be ciliary body. And this used to be limbal sclera. And this used to be choroid. <laughs> And uh, this used to be choroid, and this used to be limbal sclera. <laughs> so whatever has happened, um, none of those things exist anymore, and they've been replaced with purple. Uh, 
Purple means cells. The purple, the purple is never good, especially if you're the patient. For that quantity. Yeah, <laughs> it's too much the purple. Um, okay, so the purple is the same no matter where we go, but just for orientation purposes, uh, here's our cornea, here's our used to be iris, and then here's lens and posteriorly, it looks much the same. Um, so I actually wanna show it to you from really low magnification because I want you to appreciate something structurally. So we've got oceans and oceans of purple um, and there's no architecture whatsoever to any of this, but then there's all of these tiny little more clear areas um, which represent individual cells. And so I just want you to remember this picture, lots and lots of purple and then individual punched out clear spots that represent individual cells. And when we go closer, um, so you can see all of these cells, they're round, they don't have a ton of cytoplasm, they do have really big nuclei with really large multiple nucleoli. Um, there are mitotic figures to the moon, and then there are these big clear punched out spots. And these spots, are what we call tangible body macrophages. So they're macrophages that are here, they're eating up all of the debris of these neoplastic round cells that are dying. Um, and they are something that we describe as a classic feature of B cell lymphoma. Um, they can obviously be in plenty of other conditions, um, but if you have a uh, round cell neoplasm, that has a whole bunch of tangible body macrophages in it, uh, B-cell lymphoma becomes quite high on your list of differentials because they usually go together. Um, in this case, the ophthalmologist suspected lymphoma and we told them they were right. We also told them we could do immunohistochemistry to decide whether this was B-cell or T-cell and they declined. I think they decided that knowing that it was lymphoma was good enough for their sort of treatment plan. Um, other than that, there was a cataract, um, which you can honestly, we'll go closer so everyone can enjoy it. Um, we've got all of these more gagnon globules, big liquefied blobbies of lens protein. Um, and then there was also retinal detachment, but since we saw that on the other case, I don't think we need to cover it in the interest of time. Um, so we told them this could be uh, primary intraocular or presumed solitary ocular lymphoma, in which case it would have a much better prognosis than if it's sort of metastatic from somewhere else. Uh, but we didn't get any follow-up to tell us sort of what happened uh, with this case. So it remains a mystery. And I am done. Why we switch presenters? Uh, we had a, that's a very uh, esoteric, tangential point. We have a discussion about the term tangible once in terms of like oh, sorry. people didn't know it was tangible or tangible but we found out it was tangible and it comes from the ability of being stained and um one of those things pathologists do name weird things or name structures weird things tangible meaning that it is stainable or it has the capacity of being stained it's they don't stay though. Well, so it's, uh, it's unchangeable. <laughs> <laughs> like water and air and fat. Well, the fat is changeable with the right stain. The right conditions are changeable. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's just one of us. Nothing else is about um, So the next case is. Uh, bear. Um, so bear is a five-year, eight-month-old neutered male boxer mix. Um, the owner noted acute changes to the left eye. Um, they don't say what acute changes the owner noticed. Um, presented with a blind, mildly bufalmic, edematous-looking eye with severe uveitis and keratitis. The bulbar and palpebral conjunctiva was also very red and inflamed. Um, and they write, Help us figure out what this dog did. Trauma, tumor, we'll find out. So um, it was an exciting case because we could find out. Uh, so let's take a look at the gross image. That cornea up here and 
we have a sclera, and you can kind of make out the nice outline of that very white um, collagenous tunic. But there are some areas where that, that sclera basically dissolves into this thickened, um, firm, it was firm grossly, um, and tan tissue um, that is affecting the conjunctiva, expanding that conjunctiva. It's expanding the episcleral tissue, and it blends into sclera, as we see here. Um, the inside of the eye, meanwhile, is looking pretty unbothered by everything that's going on. Mostly what's going on is on the outside. Um, so let's take a look. Switch to it. Whoops, like so. And switch. Okay, here we go. There we go. Whoops, this way. So here's our eye, and we'll start over here. And where we saw that area of greatest tan expansion, um, what we end up with is uh, lots of purple again, but a different kind of purple. And there are these sort of snaking strands of paler cells coalescing through this area as well. I'm gonna make them out here. Look at these bands of cells. So let's take a look at that closer. Okay, we reversed it. So. so those bands of cells that kind of coalesce through this expanded tissue are mostly epithelioid macrophages. Is that to you? So all these cells that kind of look like epithelial cells in a way, they're plump, they're forming these, these multi-layered sort of bands. Those are all macrophages and we have them admixed with a large number of small lymphocytes. But most of the cells that are here are macrophages and they're invading the scleral collagen. They're expanding the episclera. They're extending a little bit into the conjunctiva and they even extend just slightly into at least the superciliary space and maybe into the ciliary body itself. Here are more of those macrophages there. But generally, the inside of the eye is fairly okay. And the collagenous tunic is what's affected. We did get these interesting little pools on occasion of this brightly eosinophilic kind of fibrillar looking material that's sort of swollen looking. Um, so that's there. And then I'll show you some other stuff too. We did get some other sections of this eye. We'll switch from the full eye to those. That band pattern is even more striking here. Look at that. It makes a very interesting pattern. And there are some areas on this section where these epithelial macrophages surround what's still at least recognizably collagen, but which looks abnormal. So in the middle of all these macrophages here, you can kind of see them at the edges. We have this little raft of very hyper eosinophilic collagen and the collagen itself doesn't have a whole lot of cells admixing with the fibers. It's basically just this raft of kind of funny looking collagen. Um, so this condition is referred to um, commonly as a necrotizing scleritis, which is a bit of a misnomer because collagen technically cannot be necrotic. It is a fibril, it is you know, an, an inert substance, um, but uh, that is what its original name was um, and still is used. Um, we will tend to call these areas sort of devitalized collagen. People also, I think, call it collagenolysis. Um, you know, there's a couple of names that you can use, I think, that are, that are okay. Um, but basically, this is a weird um, kind of devitalized collagen. And we think that because we see this frequently in these cases, um, this, these cases may represent um, an aberrant immune response that's directed at the collagen itself. Um, but we don't have proof for this. Um, so this is an inflammatory condition, non-neoplastic, um, probably an aberrant immune response. And it can be really quite devastating. Um, some of these cases can actually get scleral perforation or destabilization because of all of this inflammation and, and uh, destruction of the tissue. Um, you can see it here again, it's extending into the ciliary body. It's very severe in this case. Um, there have been both unilateral and bilateral cases of this described. Um, 
So that's this case. We were able to figure out what this dog did, which was, is always a very satisfying scenario. Just for talk about uh, talking about words, that's a interesting opportunity to use the word serpiginous. That's true. Oh, I missed my opportunity to use serpiginous. I could also use labyrinthine, which is also a favorite of mine. Labyrinthine. It's a very pretty pattern. Those condition. Not necessarily. What is striking? It is striking pattern. What is fairly classic for this condition is the predominance of macrophages in the collagenous tunic um, and these sort of devitalized rafts of collagen. That appearance with the sort of more globular eosinophilic look, which does appear here and there, especially in the conjunctiva, um, I don't see that a lot. But I mean, then again, there aren't that many cases in the database. But we presume maybe this is devitalized collagen too, or something pertinacious. This appearance was just a little bit weird. Um, more commonly and classically, it's sort of this devitalized looking collagen. There are papers out there that actually have done Masson's trichrome on these and they have like a weird staining characteristic sometimes too. So uh, macrophages, devitalized collagen, those are the classics for this condition. And uh, sclerocentricity mm -hmm. to it. Sclerocentricity. Sometimes you see, as Megan show, going into the adjacent uveal tissue, but Majority of it is in sclera. You can see it doesn't mm -hmm. go much beyond. And often they will stop at the limbus and not affect the cornea, right. which is also interesting. Mm -hmm. And also we have a few cases where it's only the cornea, yeah, and it like sure. stops the limbus and doesn't affect the sclera. So there must be something really particular about the type of collagen, the type of collagen, or the arrangement, or something that makes the immune system attack that collagen but not that collagen. So in, in humans, they have we have a similar disease to that is directly related to more um, widespread or systemic uh, autoimmune diseases. Uh, but I don't think we were able to show this correlation with dogs. Yeah. A condition that is still not completely understood. Are there any predispositions for it? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And one paper that's out there says that primarily they're all bilateral, but we definitely have cases where we get no history of the other eye being affected. So mm -hmm. who knows? <laughs> yeah. That's a asynchronous presentation or not, we don't know, but you the fact that as a pathologist you receive an eye like that is it's unilateral shouldn't prevent you from making the diagnosis. Cool. Good stuff. Uh switch back over to there you go. There's the diagnosis. Um, and on we go. So the next case is very interesting. I guess they're all interesting. <laughs> but this next case in particular. Um, so this is uh, Cora Bell, a 10-year-old female Great Dane. And they write just corneal rupture versus neoplasia in the left eye. And I had a similar experience when I grossed this case out. Um, in fact, we have in the gross notes, plugged perf about 70% of the cornea ventral lateral, and then we write maybe corneal mass instead. Um, so actually this is a mass. It does look very much like a corneal perf if you were to look at this from the front of the eye, um, sort of straight on. But once we sectioned it, you can see that the cornea is intact. You have a full range of cornea here. The interior chamber is still there. There's no iris prolapse, you know. Usually if this was a corneal purpose, brown tissue would have been like prolapse, demitus, iris, but the iris is sitting right here and it's doing just fine. Um, so basically we have a giant corneal mass. Um, it's brown. When I took the cap on this case, there were areas that looked a little bit more white. Um, and then also the other, only other thing to point out in this case is that the surface of the cornea that's not affected by the mass is also brown. You have this thin layer of brown on the surface. Um, then on cut surface, you can see the, the less pigmented stroma on the cornea. The rest of the eye, again, much like our necrotizing scleritis case, is pretty much uh, unconcerned about what's going on up front. All right, let's take a look and get some of the things off of it. There we go. Is it all? Bit of a weird tinctural characteristic here, and maybe some wax caught on the slide, so please to ignore. But what is interesting here is this mass. Once again, tons of purple, many, many cells, very densely cellular. Um, it's affecting the superficial cornea, 
and it is pretty much confined to the cornea. You can see that the bulbar conjunctiva is coming out here at the edge. It's pretty unconcerned. Um, so we have this mass that's confined to the cornea. Um, and the rest of the cornea, again, even from low magnification, also is not looking too happy. So let's take a look. All right. We've rotated 90 degrees to the right. Here is our neoplasm. Um, there are areas of fair, fairly heavy pigmentation scattered about. These cells are forming kind of coalescing nests and maybe solid areas. This one almost has a bit of an epithelioid look, but as you look around, even the cells that are kind of more poorly pigmented do still have a good amount of this sort of dusty pigmentation in their cytoplasm. And these are clearly neoplastic cells that have a little bit of pigmentation. Um, they have a vesiculate chromatin pattern. They have these huge sort of owl eyes effect type nucleoli. Um, these nuclei are kind of looking at you. Um, and this is a melanoma. So we have a melanoma. And let me just confirm for you on slightly higher magnification. This melanoma is confined to the cornea. There's maybe a little bit of extension towards the limbus, but here's the conjunctiva. It's pretty unaffected again. And here's the mass. So it's in the cornea, affecting the superficial stroma and creating this huge exophytic mass. Meanwhile, briefly, the rest of the cornea, both the epithelium is pigmented and we have some heavily pigmented cells in the superficial stroma. The epithelium is hyperplastic and keratinized. Um, the superficial stroma has this sort of dense um, character of the collagen fibers, and they're a little bit more disorganized than they typically are. Um, you might want to call a fibroplasia or clinically a fibrosis on that. Um, and there's pretty significant vascularization. So um, we have some very chronic uh, changes. There's also some lymphocytes and plasma cells. I'll point that out to a couple of types of plasma cells. Um, so we have a pretty chronic um, inflammation and keratitis, and it's pigmentary in nature um, in the background of this case. Um, and that's important to point out because typically melanocytes don't really live in the cornea. This is not their home. Um, they will uh, be in the cornea for a variety of nonspecific sort of reactive reasons, right? One of the, some of the common things that cornea does when it is bothered, um, the epithelium will become hyperplastic and keratinized. You get vascularization. Um, you get uh, inflammatory cells that can come in through the tear film or via those vessels. And you can get pigmentation. It can be variable depending on the case. Um, super common, nonspecific reactive things that the cornea does. Um, and the idea in this case is that most likely this pre-existing chronic keratitis that has such a high um, pigmentary component provided the melanocytes in the cornea that then became neoplastic. Um, because otherwise melanocytes just aren't a normal resident in the cornea. Um, and this mass is pretty confined to just the cornea. Um, this is super rare. Uh, in the entirety of the Coplau database, we have like six or seven of these cases of specifically just corneal melanoma, um, where we can be pretty confident that it didn't, you know, arise in the conjunctiva and spread in towards the cornea or anything like that. Um, so we're not necessarily certain about uh, the prognostication for these, if there's any differences between a cornea-only melanoma and the prognosis um, versus melanoma that arises elsewhere, um, just because it's so uncommon. Um, but an interesting case, um, another uh, neoplasm that we'll sometimes see in the cornea is hemangiosarcoma. And similarly with that one, um, typically the corneal stroma is nearly avascular, um, basically effectively avascular. And so it's another case where we would typically expect that um, vascularization of the cornea must be pre-existing before that type of a neoplasm can develop. Um, so pretty cool, corneal neoplasia, um, pretty rare. And- uh, was it in the epithelium? I think the epithelium is, yeah. Like, Try the one right next to the, the base of the- Like down here? Yeah. Yeah. You'd be luckier over there. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd say so. So, epithelium is in the epithelium, which uh, probably was audible. And then uh, you can see these cells here that are pretty clearly neoplastic. They're, you know, not, it's not so great nuclear features, and they're kind of in the basal layer of this epithelium. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some degree of extension to the epithelium. Um, it's important to note that because, uh, for example, conjunctival epithelium or conjunctival melanomas will tend to have some pretty significant epithelial involvement, um, and they can spread fairly different, fairly distant from the main mass in the epithelium. 
um, like litigious spread. And um, that can be um, presumably part of the reason why chondrocheral melanomas can be so aggressive and difficult to completely excise. Because even if you get the main mass, if they're spreading distant from the main mass in the epithelium, it can be hard to get all the neoplastic cells out. Um, in this case, at least, we didn't see any neoplastic cells reach the edge uh, in the epithelium or as part of the main mass, which would be nice. Although there is some pigmentation there. Um, yeah, so it's really good to point out epithelial involvement. Um, what bigger dog was this? This was a Great Dane. Yeah. 10 year old Great Dane. Yes. I wonder if they had like pandas or something. So weird. Mm -hmm. It's so unusual that Great Dane. Usually this is a squash face breed kind of thing. Yeah. You, yeah, the pigmentary keratopathies or the pigmentary keratitis. There's, there was something going on in the background in that cornea, um, something very chronic. So, uh, yeah. It looks diffuse, so. Yep. yep. Agreed. Could have been pandas at some point that evolved to be something more diffuse, but yeah. I wonder if this dog uh, had like really bad eyelid confirmation mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. Like it's closer or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. They do sometimes get Case those yes, macroblephron. So. Yeah, or, you know, dry eye or tear film issues. Cool. There you go. There's the diagnosis, and I will shift. Thanks, right. cheers. Mm -hmm. All right. First up for Gillian is uh, Lucille Ball. <laughs> Lucille is a one year, three month old Great Dane. With a history we got said removed left eye surgically. Thank you. Good. Um, history of scratch or rupture when only weeks old by the litter mate. Um, so there we go. Uh, did not seem to have vision in the eye. Microphthalmia due to not forming correctly. Uh, they said the other eye, they actually checked both yes and no for the other eye being normal. So we're not quite sure. Um, anyway, so we got the globe. And um, so we said that it was a small globe, um, but as you can see, it's actually pretty well proportioned. Like the sclera is not wrinkled. The cornea might be slightly wrinkled up here, but um, ultimately it doesn't really look like it's the typical thesical globe that has shrunken after being a normal size. So there's something probably abnormal about this globe from the get go. Okay, so what we did see is that there's this uh, central bulge from the cornea, this sort of off white uh, little bulge that you can see poking up there. Um, as far as the inside of the globe goes, uh, the lens is not apparent. And then we have the retina that is diffusely detached and you can see it sort of um, extends up toward the anterior segment. Um, here's the iris leaflets. And I think that's about all we can say from this gross image. Uh, the cornea itself looks like it's quite opaque. So there might be some edema or fibrosis in there or something like that. So um, we actually got two sections of this and I'll show you the, the section of just the cornea first. And then I will do all of the things that I need to do so that you can see the thing. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so uh, what we have, here's our section of just the anterior segment. And what we have is this, here's that little bulge that we saw grossly. Um, the cornea, which is right below that, the corneal stroma actually looks very similar to the scleral collagen, um, which is, uh, pretty characteristic of when there's like severe corneal stromal uh, fibril like disorganization, uh, which we sometimes just wave our hands and call that fibrosis. Um, and then what we also see here, and this is probably somewhat of a peripheral section, uh, but we don't have much of an anterior chamber. Here's a little bit of that anterior chamber, um, but uh, it's a little bit hard to uh, see decimate. You can't see really decimate membrane from this magnification anyway. Um, and then, so the iris is um, 
close to that cornea. I'm going to show you the other uh, section as well at this magnification. Um, sadly, with eyes, we don't always get to um, experience all of the things that we see grossly in that section, in that single section that we typically look at uh, because of the way things are sectioned, uh, three-dimensional and all. Anyway, so back here is the optic nerve. I know it's out of focus there. Um, there's a little nubbin extending from it. That's actually the retina. And remember in that gross photo, the retina really extended all the way up to the anterior segment. Um, as far as the anterior part of the eye goes, here's more of that little blob that was extruding uh, from the uh, cornea. The cornea here actually looks a little bit more normal. So I think this is a more central section. Uh, so we have at least some more normal corneal stroma deeply here. Um, the anterior segment, uh, the anterior uvea, I mean, looks relatively okay, except that there's this uh, at least focal area of anterior sneakia of this iris leaflet to the cornea. And um, this angle looks okay from this magnification. And here's more of that detached retina. So let's jump right in. <clears throat> so first of all, what the heck is this? Uh, and that's a good question. Um, let's go take a look. Uh, first of all, the, the cornea itself, you can see how heavily pigmented that corneal epithelium is there. And so this is, uh, once again, that, that sort of nonspecific reactive change that Megan was just talking about. And then um, here we have uh, that little bulgy bit. So let's take a quick look at what this is. Um, so it's sort of nondescript. Um, it looks perhaps a little bit like a brain. Uh, so we have a little bit of a corneal brain here. Probably what this is and what our assumption is, is that this was actually part of the retina that was extruded through a corneal defect and somehow still managed to main, stay attached to the eye. Um, you can see there are a few blood vessels in it here. Um, and then let's take a look at... So dust maze membrane is intact in this section, in this area, until you get right here. And that, oh, that's peripheral. Oh no, see, it's like intermittent. Mm -hmm. So you can see it, some of it's right there, but then you have like this uh, displaced uveal tissue that's sort of blending with the deep corneal stroma. And if we follow it along, uh, we get to this area right here. And what we have is sort of a, an almost branching of uh, arborization, if you call it, of the terminus of decimase membrane, and it's attaching right up to irritable tissue. So this is an abnormal irritable corneal angle, and it's either suggestive of gonadogenesis or in a young dog like this, perhaps anterior segment dysgenesis. And it's the same story on the other side. So let's follow decimase membrane. So it's once again intermittent. Yeah, and explain how there's you feel. Right, yeah, embedded in the stroma every yeah where the rest of the membrane is missing. Yeah, yeah, and um, so it's a kind of a same story over here. So on this side, decimase membrane doesn't really taper, or sorry, it doesn't arborize, but it tapers instead. But there's no ciliary cleft, and so irritable tissue comes right up and joins the under mm -hmm. membrane. So this is a totally abnormal angle, um, and, and in a young dog like this, remember Lucille Ball is only one year, three months old. Uh, we would call this anterior segment dysgenesis uh, as opposed to gonio dysgenesis, <clears throat> which is sort of just a, uh, in a way, tomato, tomato. Um, and especially because they didn't uh, describe glaucoma in this eye either. Um, so interestingly, when we work, work our way backwards a little bit, the, the retina that's still in the eye actually looks identifiably like a retina, uh, which is in great contrast to what we have living under that corneal epithelium. So I think this is a little bit of a puzzling feature of this case. And a colleague of ours got in touch with us a, a couple months ago and said, hey, I have this case. Um, it has this weird stuff in the cornea and it, it doesn't, it looks sort of like primitive neural tissue. And we're like, oh, well, well that's totally gonna be extruded retina. And he's like, but it doesn't look anything like retina. And it, we're like, shrug our shoulders and say, yeah, but we still think it's retina. <laughs> um, and this is a really interesting case uh, example of that where we still have intraocular retina that's identifiably retina with at least some layers. It's definitely atrophy. We're missing definitely part of the layers. But then we have this other tissue that's up in the cornea that literally looks like neural tissue, i.e. brain. And we assume that it's retina, but who knows? And maybe it's because it was, it's, it 
was trapped in the cornea at such an early stage of development that it lacked all of the cues that it needed to develop into the multi-layered retina that we know. I don't really know. Yeah, either that or I wonder if that stuff in there just went through atrophy and gliosis and where we're seeing sort of like a, you know, astrocytosis, you know, astrocytic sort of reaction of the cornea that was left in there. Yeah. It, it, this one is an interesting case because yeah, I like the fact that the remaining retina is still recognized as such. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, really weird case. And as you may have no, uh, noticed, there's no lens here. So uh, we didn't find any evidence of lens in the eye either. Um, the other section looks pretty similar to this. Um, so we've we've almost exhausted the interesting stuff with this case. Um, so there's more of that corneal yeah. brain. I don't know, it's weird. Um, and, and the lens just for clarification sake is probably stupid. We are very unlikely to have a lenticular agenesis and formation of an actual eye around. Yeah, so um, we propose two different uh, possibilities for this yeah. eye. One is early life trauma slash anterior chamber collapse syndrome, which is a set of lesions that occurs, um, we believe, uh, associated with a very early in life corneal perforation, uh, possibly in utero, just because there's often very little inflammation anywhere. Um, uh, so in other words, behind closed eyelids, like before the eyelids open at two weeks of age, um, and this can happen in dogs and cats. Um, and then the other one is Peter's anomaly or anterior chamber cleavage syndrome, or in human medicine, that's actually under the umbrella called anterior segment dysgenesis. So we have a little bit of a nomenclature difference between copile at least and human medicine. Um, and that is typically an axial defect in eye development. So you typically have a deep corneal stromal defect with um, absence of decimase membrane. And then usually the iris is incorporated into the cornea at that point. Sometimes the lens is involved. Um, and then that's just one flavor of the many different varieties of anterior segments of genesis in human medicine. Um, so anyway, this case is a little bit mysterious. We don't really know what the pathogenesis was. Um, and There's a trauma story, but who knows, right? Yeah, right. So yeah, they mentioned trauma, um, history of scratch or rupture when only weeks old. So who knows if that was the thing that precipitated this or if the eye was abnormal to begin with and like something happened and then they just happened to look closer at this eye and notice it was abnormal. And we're assuming it's a cat, I guess. Well, not. no, not necessarily. Um, I think, yeah, by a litter mate, which would oh, be a, litter mate. a puppy. That would have been weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so so we really don't know. Um, and in with the early life trauma slash anterior chamber collapse syndrome cases, I really started pondering whether perhaps there's some sort of predisposition. So maybe they already have some sort of an axial corneal defect or some sort of corneal um, issue that um, then makes it predisposed to like this rupture with extrusion of lens and retina, et cetera. Um, so I don't know, and maybe even coming through the birth canal. And you could imagine if the if the cornea ruptured and the lens was extruded into the fornix, essentially behind those closed eyelids, that as soon as the eyelids open, that little lens would pop right out. Um, but yeah, I don't know. We don't have an answer. I'm not sure we'll ever get an answer, but kind of a cool case, Very cool. especially with that corneal brain. All right, moving on. Next case is Sadie. Sadie is a golden retriever. She is two years old. Uh, the history we got was diagnosed with juvenile cataract in the left eye, which is this one, in 2021. So at some point before she was two years old, maybe she was a year old or so. Um, and then she developed, oh, and then they did uh, cataract surgery. So they did phacal emulsification performed and then developed um, secondary glaucoma early in 2022. Uh, medical therapy failed, and they did multiple rounds of chemical ablations. So we presume that's intravitreal gentamicin. Um, and then it says owner ultimately elected a nucleation due to the globe not being cosmetically pleasing. So sorry, Sadie, it's got to go. I mean, it was blind and probably uncomfortable as well. So, you know. Um, so I would say that this glow, that the ophthalmology team treating this patient did everything they possibly could to try to maintain vision and a comfortable eye. 
And unfortunately, it ultimately failed. Um, I like to say this, I was done to death. Um, so ultimately ended up in a jar on our counter. Um, so when we cut it, uh, we noted that it was bufthalmic um, and that, let's see here, the cornea was cloudy to nearly opaque. Um, and you can see that up here. And then um, the eye was filled with this uh, reddish tinged fluid that's quite sparkly. And whenever you see sparkles in fluid in the eye, it means there's going to be cholesterol crystals floating around. And that, and especially with the hemorrhagic fluid like this, it ultimately is consistent with a uh, long-term uh, breakdown of red blood cells. Um, so that's just an, an indication of very chronic hemorrhage. And also all of this um, tan, gritty, maybe sort slightly gritty material lining the back of the eye and the fundus here is probably going to be hemosiderin laden macrophages um, along with more cholesterol crystals. And uh, sometimes there's mineral as well. Okay, what else did we see? We said the anterior chamber was collapsed. So the iris is up here somewhere uh, very closely associated with that cornea. Uh, we said there was actually an IOL present, so an intraocular lens, which is a fake lens that they put in um, when they remove cataract this lens. Uh, I can't really see it in this yeah, image. Uh, right under the... It might not have been in this section. Oh, I see. It's hard to say. I can't remember if it's in There's the section. There's a slit there. To... Yeah. Tension. Yeah. Anyway, um, and then the retina was diffusely detached, and it's like this little tornado here. And presumably torn, although there, there could be retina coming up and around here and joining this little tornado. Uh, the optic nerve head really couldn't be evaluated uh, because the retina was detached. Um, so there we go. Now I will switch. There we go. Here's our corneal brain. Okay. So the subgross of this globe is not so exciting because there's not a whole lot left in the in the center of it, uh, but we there are some interesting things happening elsewhere. So um, here's the cornea, and you can see the anterior chamber is uh, fairly collapsed. There's a little bit of it left here. I keep trying to put the arrow yeah, in like the screen in the middle. So sorry about that. Um, here's some of the anterior chamber. There's some protonaceous material in it, and you can see that the iris. Um, well, it's hard to make out, but this is the iris right here. And then there's collagenous tissue sort of around it, causing broad anterior synechia and anterior chamber collapse, at least regionally. Um, and then uh, scattered about, you can also see there are these accumulations of what I'll tell you are red blood cells. And then same uh, with back here. Um, so that right there are probably those accumulations of hemosiderin laden macrophages. And then we there's our optic nerve, uh, which you can see is cupped in this uh, section. So there was definitely glaucoma. Not that there was much of a surprise or uh, that was expected. Um, so let's just go ahead. All right. Okay. So the cornea itself, the stroma is vascularized and sort of disorganized. Um, so we call that fibrosis and vascularization. Um, you can see that Decimase's membrane is multifocally discontinuous. So here's a very nice example where we have a little bit of curling of one end. Here's another end. And you can see this sort of slightly basophilic collagen with a bunch of plump spindle cells fills the gap and extends into the deep corneal stroma as well, in, as, well as into the anterior chamber, which is contributing to that pre irritable membrane as well as the anterior sneakia. Um, so this is fibrosis or fibroplasia. Um, and decimase membrane was actually multifocally discontinuous across this eye, which is probably consistent with the bufthalmus. One of these breaks in decimase membrane might actually be the surgical site, but I wasn't really convinced uh, grossly. But this is a beautiful example of where we have that break in decimase membrane, um, and you get this really exuberant um, sort of fibroplasia or fibrosis uh, corresponding to that. I think this occurs more commonly in young animals. Um, they just tend to be more reactive to all the things that happen in the eye. Um, so we have this anterior chamber fibrosis or collagen. Um, that is uh, contributing to this broad anterior synechia. It's enveloping the iris um, and filling the anterior chamber, at least in this area. Here's some of that hemorrhage I talked about. Um, and then also uh, firmly adhered to the 
Yep. To the uh, back of the iris is the lens capsule. So here's the anterior lens capsule because it's quite thick. And then also this sort of vaguely refractile structure here is actually the IOL. So it was present um, and it was just hard to make out grossly. Um, so uh, most IOLs that they use these days, the softer ones are easily sectioned by histotechnologists in the histo lab. So we leave them in place. Um, the hard acrylic ones we try to remove because that would probably elicit many swear words by the histotechs if we left them in. Um, and anyway, so here is more of that posterior lens capsule. So it's all quite, quite wrinkled up. And also very commonly in eyes from young animals that have had cataract surgery that we get, there's often um, either exuberant regrowth or um, collagen deposition inside the lens capsule. And that once again is just associated with young animals seem to be a lot more reactive. Their lens epithelial cells that might remain after cataract surgery tend to elaborate a lot of stuff after the fact. Um, let's see here. If we, we didn't actually sample the capsulotomy site in this one, but there's more of the IOL. I don't know if you can see it. Woo, there we go. There it is. Um, if you it will stain nicely with an Alshin blue stain if you ever need feel the need to stain an IOL. Um, so let's move back. Uh, not surprising, there's some of that hemorrhage, and we'll go back here and uh, admire that nice carpet of epithelioid macrophages associated with the breakdown of all that hemorrhage. Sparkles. Yeah, so all of these uh, spindle cells over here are macrophages. Um, and then all of these white clefts here are the acicular clefts that are consistent with cholesterol crystals, um, which uh, actually get dissolved during processing. So we don't actually see them uh, when we are looking at a, a regular FFPE, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, uh, you have to do something special to be able to sample those without um, having them wash away. I'm anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, some of these macrophages you can see have some brown stuff in their tummies, and that is hemosiderin and or hematoidin, uh, which are uh, breakdown products of the hemoglobin in red blood cells. And so we basically have what is essentially a sort of a granulomatous response to chronic intraocular hemorrhage. Um, let's see here. One more thought I had was this dog has a history of multiple ciliary body ablations uh, with presumably gentamicin. Um, the purpose of that is to essentially kill off the iridociliary epithelium that is producing aqueous humor, which is the non-pigmented ciliary body epithelium. Um, and in some cases it's more, uh, effective than others. This one, this globe is kind of such a hot mess because of all the, the chronicity and the fibrosis and all that stuff. That's a little bit hard to definitively say like, oh yeah, there's an area with it where, where we think the gentamicin was responsible for, um, what's going on with the, the ciliary body epithelium. So here is some iridociliary epithelium. And then here's more of that collagenous deposition that sort of widespread um, membrane formation in the eye, uh, which may or may not be part are associated with the ciliary body, or sorry, yeah, the ciliary body ablation, the int presumed intravitreal gentamicin. So uh, what time is it? Oh, it's nine o'clock. So we are done. Uh, hopefully you learned something and had fun. Oh, I can quickly go back over here. Um, so a ton of different, um, oh, I forgot about that one. Anyway, let's, let's just move on. It's nine o'clock. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Stop the recording now. <laughs>